Right, so we come to our first question. Uh, first question is usually straightforward. However, this one wasn't. The majority question, uh, majority of students got question 1A wrong. So it says the Sankey diagrams, which we all have seen before, show the energy transfers. Now, that means that is going to be key. If we're going to kind of focus on one word in all these questions, it would definitely be energy. So it's the energy transfers in a traditional coal burning power station and a combined heat and power station. Now, I don't know a lot about combined heat and power stations. You probably don't. So a lot of the information is going to be in question. You can see they've given us a diagram here that compares the two. And that diagram is going to be very useful for the majority of the questions, uh, majority of the sub questions in this question. So uh, we start off with this question. What effect does the waste energy from a power station have on surroundings now again we said at the beginning the key word is energy when we're talking about energy we can only talk about the different types of energy really um so in this case you know sometimes we might think power station surroundings your natural conclusion would be maybe something like pollutants uh, maybe co2 co2 pollutants gases they are not types of energy okay so we've got to think of a type of energy that's going to have an effect on the surroundings so we've got to link it to this word energy okay uh second question um again not not particularly easy considering this first one so it says calculate the efficiency of the chp station so straight away i'm just going to make sure i don't make a simple mistake because it's got the word calculate i'm going to need some values now this is an unusual question in that there are no values in the question so that means i'm going to have to use my diagram uh, it says use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet in this case quite lucky as only one really applies we've got efficiency and it's about useful energy out and useful energy in so to do that what we need to do is we need to look at the energy in and the useful energy out this one will not be useful energy out because it's worse energy this one and this one they're both useful so what you do is you would count the squares to get a relative value for the useful energy in and that looks like there are 20 squares so that's going to go on the bottom and then i would count the squares here and here because remember these are both useful forms of energy I'd write that there and then it says times 100 and you must give your answer if you times it by 100 in percentage terms as it says times 100 percent if we wrote joules that wouldn't be a measure of efficiency and would actually lose the mark even if we got the right answer um, our next question why is a CHP station more efficient than a traditional coal burning power station now if i just read this question uh, without looking at the diagrams i would struggle because i don't really have that knowledge but the diagrams do help us so we've got waste energy and that's what's different between them okay so the chp station is more efficient so what we've got to do is we've got to mention that i definitely mention about waste energy and the comparison and then I'd look for what else is different. The electricity produced is actually the same. So I'd be looking at this and I'd be making a mention of that. And I think if I mention about the waste energy and this energy used to heat local homes, offices and factories, I would probably have got the two marks required for the question because it is a straightforward one. Next, it's on about the national grid and it just says, what is the national grid? Now, what? It's just a simple recall question, but I have tried to make it tricky by making answers that are that are all potentially feasible if you didn't know your stuff. Um, so we've got a system of cables and pylons. Um, you've got to think, are pylons involved in the transfer of the electricity? We've got a system of cables and transformers. And we've got another very similar one, a system of cables, transformers and power stations. And again, you'd want to think, are they involved in the transfer of electricity? And then it says using the electricity locally and not transmitted through the national grid increases the overall efficiency of a CHP station by 
so not transmitting it through the national grid give one reason why and because it's about efficiency I would be going back to our idea about wasted energy because if something has less wasted energy it must therefore be more efficient so there must be something about the national grid that's causing it to waste energy but you probably don't need to know in that much detail we come on to question two which is fairly straightforward um, the picture shows a person taking a hot shower um, thankfully censored by AQA um, so we've got when a person uses the shower the mirror gets misty so there's nothing in this question that's going to be confusing in the way the question's worded a simple why so you've got to explain um, so we've got the mirror we've got the shower and we've got to really link it to water because it's the water that's going to be causing that so we're basically going to be describing the path of water from here to here because this is worth three marks this is around the area where I'd start to do a little plan and I'd think about any keywords that I want to include so I'm going to have to talk about water particles um, I'm going to have to talk about condensation and evaporation because these are really the two keywords for this answer and if I explain those and link it to the question and link it to the idea of water particles I should do pretty well uh, next one the homeowner installs an electrically heated mirror now that's going to be the important thing particularly the heated part mirror into the shower room when a person has a shower the heated mirror does not become misty bold very nice of AQA to make that clear does not become misty but stays clear why does the mirror stay clear so again I'm gonna to have to link it to condensation like I was talking about in my previous answer and condensation wouldn't really be happening if it's not becoming misty and I'm also going to link it to this idea of heat so if I can link heat and condensation I should be doing pretty well uh, the third question was actually parts of it were pretty tricky um, this is the kind of question where if you can you can gather maybe half marks you're not doing bad at all you're in fact doing pretty well better than the majority of students by far so we start off with light waves transfer energy complete the following sentence the oscillations we've got a hard word okay um producing a light wave are something to the direction of the energy transfer by the light wave one mark They're looking for one word essentially uh, what you've got to think is there are two forms of wave transverse and longitudinal now that won't be the answer because that's not about the oscillations but each of those does produce oscillations in a different way so transverse are these ones where it produces them at what we call right angles or perpendicular so the waves travel in that way but the oscillations go up and down um, longitudinal is best thought of with a slinky so you kind of get them vibrations going along the wave so it's as if you're pushing the slinky back and forth so you need to know these things it's a very tricky question um, 3a part 2 the apparatus in the diagram shows that light waves can transfer energy okay got a nice diagram describe so we're just going to say how we're not going to say why okay so it's how how switching the desk lamp on and off so this we're going off shows that light waves transfer energy okay you do not need to describe the energy transfers so we wouldn't be saying it goes from light okay and then we've got electrical and then we've got kinetic we, we wouldn't be doing that there'd be no need um so we've basically just got to say an, exce an exceptionally simple experiment we could do to show that energy is transferred okay we'll be talking about these and what happens to them when the light is on 
when the light is off and that's all we'd need to do really straightforward and now on to a really tricky question the majority of students um, I think pretty much half of them didn't score any marks on this and it's out of four so again if you can score well on this it makes a significant difference so a student holds a wristwatch in front of a plain mirror plain just means flat the student can see an image of the wristwatch in the mirror okay so that's going to be important the diagram shows the position of the wristwatch and the mirror so we've got a wristwatch we've got our mirror no other help draw a rear diagram showing how the image of the wristwatch is formed mark the position of the image so probably going to get a few marks for this and a mark for this to make our four. First thing rear diagrams are drawn with straight lines not like that I can't draw a straight line unfortunately and they have arrows on them so what we've got to do is we've got to show how an image of this wrist watch is formed so I would start by drawing some rays of light that hit the mirror um, if you remember from key stage three okay the rays of light are going to be reflected at the same angle at which they came in at so you'd probably want to be using a protractor here to be honest okay so we would get something like that mine won't be correct you'd have to measure yours with a protractor the thing is that doesn't actually show how the image is formed okay these are just rays of light bouncing back okay so what we've got to do is we've got to trace it back these rays of light behind the mirror and where the rays of light converge that would be our image I realize I'm just kind of telling you the answer here but it's it's very very difficult unless you know this type of question you can see it's it's well worth learning I think it's only come up twice um, in about four years but both times it's been for a significant number of marks so I'd probably have a look at how you do that um, next one the image of the wristwatch seen by the student is virtual what is a virtual image again there's not much advice I can give you in in time in terms of how you interpret the question you've just got to know what virtual is if you've done the diagram correct that might help you next question for you was much much more straightforward it was a nice question but it was a six marker I can't see it down here but it's worth six marks so I would good English using specialized terms organizing information is going to be really important so you've got a vacuum flask um, and it's labeled some things now I would be mentioning all of these things not so much the hot liquid because that's just what's in there in terms of how they help to reduce the rate of energy transfer by heating processes says describe how the design of the vacuum flask keeps the liquid inside hot now that is our biggest clue because when we're talking about heating processes we're going to think about infrared radiation we're going to think about conduction and we're going to think about convection For a six mark question I definitely want to be making a little plan so I'd be thinking right convection conduction and radiation and then I'd be thinking about each one of these things so silver surfaces I'd be linking that to radiation and I'd be trying to explain how silver surfaces reduce the rate of energy transfer. Um, we've got a vacuum and I'd be linking that to conduction and convection because they both require particles. Now just saying it has a vacuum won't get you any marks but if you can explain how that would stop conduction and convection would help. Uh, plastic cap, well the liquids here plastic caps up here so there's a bit of a barrier between them so we're not going to be talking about conduction because conduction only takes place in a solid so that's probably going to be convection so we'll have 
Tahuel plastic cap there. And the double walled glass container. Now, keyword here is glass. They're not making it out of metal. So I'd probably be mentioning why they've chosen glass and why it's double walled. Okay, so they've got here and here. Okay, and then through all that, if you explain all those processes correctly and in detail, you should be able to get six marks, but not many people did. Okay, and again, we have the nice second part of this question. So Arctic foxes live in a very cold environment, so that's going to be key. They have very small ears. How does the size of the ears help to keep the fox warm in a cold environment? So this is basically about heat loss. And one of the things you'll know, for example, is that elephants live in a hot environment and they have much larger ears, very large ears, okay, and they're designed to lose heat. So it's kind of um, the opposite. I think what I'd have to refer to in this answer to get a good mark is something called the surface area to volume ratio and I'd be explaining how that helps the fox to retain heat and not lose it. Again, two marks so you probably wouldn't have to say that much. Getting towards the higher demand questions now. So this one, an electric immersion here, that's just straightforward heater. Uh, used to heat the water in a domestic hot water tank. Again, some of these words are quite confusing. Domestic just means at home. When the immersion heater is switched on, the, on the water at the bottom of the tank gets hot. So we've got our immersion heater at the bottom. Okay, and it says, so this water will start to get hot. And you can see the cold water is coming in, but the hot water is coming out up here. Energy is transferred by the process of convection. Ah, so they've already given us one of the words, so we're not really going to be able to get a mark from that. From the hot water at the bottom to the cooler water at the top. Explain how. For four marks. So basically, in this question, we're just explaining how convection works. So again, I'd be thinking about a little plant. I'd be thinking about particles. I'd be thinking about something we call kinetic theory, which is basically how much particles move when they've got energy. So if they've got a lot of energy, uh, they move fast and they also spread apart. So my third idea that I'd need to be referring to is density, which is um, for, the, for this purpose, it's the number of particles in a given volume. Okay, all the mass in a given volume. Okay, so we've got to explain how particles get from here up to here. Okay, and we've got to refer to these things. 5B, really straightforward, complete the following sentence. Um, usually these one mark questions can actually be quite tricky, but it says the main way energy is transferred through the copper wall of the water tank is by the process of, now that's a solid, so the main heating process, main energy transfer of heat process that occurs in solids, and then we should be able to get it and write it there. Um, the part C was, was again getting a bit harder. Okay, we're, we're now facing graphs. Okay, and graphs can be quite hard to interpret if you don't do it correctly. So it says the immersion heater has a thermostat to control the water temperature. So thermostat, the idea is it keeps the temperature reasonably constant. When the temperature of the water inside the tank reaches 58 degrees C, the thermostat switches the heater off. The thermostat switches the heater back on when the temperature of the water falls to 50 degrees C, so it should always really remain within 50, between 50 and 58 degrees Celsius. Graph A shows how the temperature of the water inside a hot water tank changes with time. The tank is not insulated. says the temperature of the water falls at the fastest rate just after the heater switches off. Explain why. So what you've got to think there, so you can see this is falling far steeper than it is here. Okay, you can see the steepness, the gradient. Um, what we've got to do is compare that then to the temperature 
of the outside of the heater. Now when there's a big gap between two temperatures, so let's say you've got um, a beaker of really hot water and you've got a cold room, heat energy is transferred much quicker than if say you had maybe a warm beaker and a cold room. Okay, that would cool down slower. So we've got to refer to the temperature outside and we've got to compare it to the temperature in the immersion heat, uh, in the hot water tank. And so uh, we've got 5C part 2, which is again another calculation question. So calculate the mass of water in the tank and it gives us some values up here. Now the values are really important. So it says to heat the water in the tank from 50 degrees to 58 degrees. The immersion heater transfers 4032 kilojoules of energy to the water. It gives us the specific heat capacity of water and then it says use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet. In P1 it's very difficult to get confused between the equations, there's only five of them and they're, they're quite clear what the ones. So this is our equation. Okay. Um, a couple of things to note, they want you to find out the mass. Now that means I mean, essentially, you can see it's a three mark question, so they're not going to be wanting you to calculate any transfer. It'd be too too straightforward. So you're going to have to do some rearranging. Uh, second thing, it wants the temperature change. Now, if we look back up here, ours has gone from 50 degrees C to 58 degrees C. So we're going to have an eight degrees C temperature rise. Um, I wouldn't be doing this using a magic triangle because we've got more than two, val uh, more than three values. So first thing you want to do is plug it all in. We don't know M. Uh, we do know the specific heat capacity, 4,200. And we do know the temperature change, which we're not going to write 50 or 58. We're going to write in eight because that's the actual temperature change. Okay plus eight. Um, then just as you would do in maths, okay, you will try and get M on its own. So making M the subject of the equation, that's what they call it in maths. So you could start off, for example, by dividing both sides by eight. And then we can get rid of this with eight divided by eight is one. So we can ignore that. And then you do the same thing with 4,200. And then you should be able to get M on its own pretty quickly. Uh, final part of the question, it's a long question this, 13 marks. Um, an insulating jacket is fitted to the hot water tank. Graph B, so this is this graph, shows how the temperature of the water inside the insulated hot water tank changes with time. An insulating jacket only costs £12 bargain. By comparing graph A with graph B, explain why fitting an insulating jacket to a hot water tank saves money. Now, with this question, graph A was actually a couple of pages back, at least one. So what you've got to do, you've got to look at them and compare them. Now, you can see the maximum and minimum temperature isn't changing because the thermostat is still functioning. Uh, so when it gets to 58 degrees, it switches off. When it gets to 50 degrees, it switches on. Um, but what you can see is the time what about three and a half hours for it to switch it back on uh, less than one and a half you might want to get correct values for this um, on graph here with no insulation so you definitely want them to refer to like the 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 length of time before it has to be switched on because when the therm uh, when the immersion heat is on it's going to be using energy and therefore costing you money when it's not on like there is long periods on this one where it's not on graph B, um, you're going to have, not, you're not going to be paying money. Uh, the other thing, it relates to this, £12. Okay, so if it costs £12, um, you'd be wanting to refer to payback time. Now, you can't work it out in this question, but payback time is the time it takes in order to pay back that initial outlay that you put um, on the insulin jacket by saving electricity. So 
an insulin jacket costs £12 okay it's going to have quite a low payback time okay you might be able to save that money that you've been spending constantly reheating that water in you know a couple of months okay and on to question number six and you can see a lot of these questions are basically focusing on energy and electricity there isn't actually that much different to that in p1 apart from the last topic so if you can know this this relatively small amount of information well you should do do reasonably um, well on these exams so in the UK over 70% of the electricity generated uh, is generated in power stations that burn fossil fuels explain one effect that burning fossil fuels has on the environment okay so if we were to just describe this we might say it produces CO2 but we've got to explain it so we've got to say the effect that that would then have so we might link it to CO2 now unlike the first question this is on about the effect it has on the environment from burning fossil fuels it's not on about energy it doesn't have to be a form of energy um, so burning CO2 and then you would then relate that to the effect it would have okay um, there are other things okay so um, sulfur dioxide is also produced and you could link that to another effect okay but we only really need to do one for two marks uh, give one way the effect on the environment described in part a, part a could be reduced assume the amount of fossil fuels burnt stays the same so what we can't do is just say use more renewables or use wind power rather than um, fossil fuels so what we've got to do is we've got to describe how co2 or so2 could be reduced this one's actually an easier answer um co2 you'd have to link you'd have to think about how co2 could be captured essentially um and you do have to know that for your spec um next one electricity can also be generated in pumped storage hydroelectric power stations an advantage of a pumped storage hydroelectric power stations is the short startup time they have what is the importance of a short startup time so startup time is how quickly it is between it um, starting being built and producing electricity and you've just got to say why it is good to have a short one of those it's fairly straightforward um, give one other advantage of a pumped storage hydroelectric power station so there are there are many um, I would probably link it to the first one and talk about uh, related to pollution but I would never write no pollution or less pollution because that's that would be key stage three I would relate it to a specific pollutant so if you talked about co2 in the first one I'd say far less co2 I wouldn't say no co2 because when it's been set up um, there will be co2 given off but when it's running there won't be um, next we're given a newspaper extract in the future it may not be possible to have constant electricity families will have to get used to using power when it's available and this is something that actually occurs in, in Africa and in India uh, in the UK the proportion of electricity generated using wind turbines is due to increase a lot some opponents of wind turbines think this will increase this increase will cause big fluctuations now that word is a key word and it might be one of those words that you don't know so fluctuations means going up and then going down and going up and going down suggest one reason why this may be true so we've got to link the idea of wind turbines to fluctuations so again not a lot of thinking to do there between 2002 and 2008 the amount of electricity used for lighting homes in the UK has decreased okay which is probably unusual because the populations remain steady or even increased in that time and you've just got to suggest one reason why and the key thing is lighting and you can probably think about your own home and the types of light bulbs you use and so we come to our final question whoop whoop um, often the hardest question um, and it starts off with a really tricky one so it says electromagnetic waves form a continuous spectrum with a range of wavelengths fine what is the approximate range of wavelengths for the of electromagnetic waves and we're given three choices and basically it's a one in three guess unless you've you've learned that specific fact it's not really testing anything 
apart from your ability to remember what's in the revision guide. Um, in this, I'd probably be tempted to, to kind of like exclude anything that seems a bit daft. So um, if you know standard form, this means 10 to the 6 would be 10 and 6 zeros. One, two, So that means a wavelength with one, what, 10 million? Yeah, so a wavelength of 10 million. 10 million seems a very, very long wave. So I probably know that one. This one seems incredibly ridiculous for a wavelength. So kind of leaves us with, with this. Uh, you can get very, very small waves. You don't get incredibly long waves. Um, infrared waves and microwaves are used for communications. Give one example of infrared wave waves being used for communication. Um, again, it's remembering certain things. Okay, it's a one mark question. You've just got to say how infrared is used for communication. Um, you couldn't say mobile phones. That would be microwaves because it says here, a mobile phone network uses microwaves to transmit signals through the air. The microwaves have a frequency of 1.8 times 10 to the power 9 hertz and travel at a speed of 3.0 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Calculate the wavelength of the microwaves. Use the correct equation from the physics equation sheet and give your answer to two significant figures. So it's a tricky question. Um, so we've got our equation here. Again, P1, no difficulty in choosing them. Um, you've got to plug your values in first. Okay, so we've got our speed first, so that's V, and we've got our frequency, so that's F. So we've got 3.0 times 10 to the 8 equals frequency 1.8 times 10 to the 9 times lambda, which is wavelength. Um, so again, it should be fairly straightforward to rearrange. Okay, so if we uh, divide both sides by 1.8 times 10 to the 9, like that, then that means I can get rid of that and that because 1.8 times 10 to the 9 divided by 1.8 times 10 to the 9 is 1, and we've just got our wavelength left. So we do that divided by that. The next thing is to make sure we know what significant figures are. So whatever we get on our answer, let's say it's um, 0 0.0159, I don't think it is. Um, in fact, it definitely isn't. So if you've got that, you've gone wrong somewhere. Um, you would have to go to two significant figures in that case. Okay, The first significant figure is this one. And the second significant figure is this one. Um, because we're reporting it to two, we've got to therefore round up or down. And you've got to make sure in this case, because that number is a, a five or greater, that you round up. So in, in my answer, which won't be right to two significant figures, it would be that. Um, and then some scientists suggest there is a possible link between using a mobile phone and male fertility. Results of the study are given in the table. Mobile phone use in hours per day. Sperm count in millions of sperm cells per centimetre cubed of semen. And with, with these tables, you've got to look for correlations. Okay, so as this increases, this decreases. Um, and it says this shows a negative correlation okay however the results do not necessarily mean using a mobile phone causes the reduced sperm count and it says suggest one reason why okay so suggest questions are usually the hardest on the exam so in this case you'd have to think about what other factors could contribute to reduced sperm count so it might be that people on the mobile phone a lot spend a lot of time in a hot office it might be that people on the mobile phones a lot are um, older or younger, um, both of which could contribute to reduced sperm count. So you'd have to think of another factor that could account for these results. 
Whoops, I lied. It wasn't the last question at all. Uh, there is one more, um, which is important. Always make sure you check your paper to make sure there isn't a question at the back. Um, this last one was about the universe. Okay, so it says observation of the spectra. Uh, that's looking at the the wavelengths of the light that's given out from distant galaxies provides evidence to support the Big Bang theory. Complete the following sentence. Um, many scientists think the Big Bang theory describes the, and then you would just have to make a, a simple statement. We'd make sure we weren't talking about some kind of TV program. Um, AA part two, tick one box to complete the sentence. Okay, by the way, there are a number of people who in the past, when they've said tick one box, have deliberately ignored that and tick two or even three. So make sure you take one. The discovery of cosmic microwave background radiation was important because it, and then you've got three choices to choose from. Um, scientists are very uncertain people. They, they do not like to say that something is definitively correct unless they have, um, you know, proof that they, they, they've seen it. We can never see the Big Bang. So this one, when you can say prove the Big Bang theory to be correct, we can, we can eliminate it straight away. It's very difficult to prove that, and I don't think we ever will. Uh, providing more evidence to support the Big Bang theory or prove the universe will continue to expand forever. Again, this is a proved one. Will it expand forever? We don't know. It might then contract at some point. So we can eliminate answers if we're not too sure. Um, the final part of the question was, was really tricky, and I wouldn't worry too much about the very last question. If you can pick up a couple of marks on it, you're doing you're doing well. So it says many stars are parts of a binary star system. Binary just means two. Binary star systems have two stars. Okay, so instead of in our solar system, uh, we have the sun in the center and then planets that orbit around it. These two stars essentially orbit around a fixed point and move. Okay, so they're not fixed. Um, it says the visible spectrum from stars includes dark lines. These lines are at specific wavelengths. Okay. And it says the diagram shows the position of two dark lines in the spectrum from the sun. It also shows the same lines. So two dark lines in the spectrum from the sun. It also shows the same lines in the spectrum from two stars, A and B, in a binary star system at the same point in time. Okay. So you can see these are the two lines here. And you can see in star A, they've been shifted to an increased wavelength. Now that's important. Okay, so we've got to think what light has an increased wavelength? Uh, star B, it's been shifted to a decreased wavelength, so these have moved, they've moved this way, and these have moved this way. Uh, what is the name given to the effect shown in the spectrum from star A? Okay, so because it's increasing wavelength, um, we've got to link that to colours of light, and we've got to refer to it being shifted. Um, 8b part 2, scientists have concluded that the two stars in a binary star system orbit around a fixed point between the two stars. A comparison of the spectra from the two stars in a binary star system provides evidence to support this conclusion. Okay, so if we imagine our diagram again with our fixed point and our two stars here and here, If we were observing, let's say if Earth is here, this red dot, this planet, uh, sorry, this star would appear to be moving towards us because it's kind of going that direction. This one would appear to be moving away from us. Okay, so we've got to relate that to both red and blue shift because if we have a look at these diagrams, this would be red shift and this would be blue shift. So we would relate our answer to these ideas.